Welcome to To Dwell in Our Midst, a study of the tabernacle and how it points us to Jesus. I am so excited that you all are here tonight. Um, and our first time together, we are going to talk about a little bit about the study, um, how it works. We're going to talk about the context um, of the study and kind of give a little bit of the background and kind of lay some of the groundwork for what we're going to be studying over the course of the next seven weeks. So my name is Erin Warren, and I'm so glad that you are here. Um, one of my um, passions is what is called inductive Bible study. So this is um, just a really big fancy word for learning how to study um, with your own heart and mind first before going to other sources. And in John 14, 26, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit to help us remember what we have heard. And he is also tells us that he will teach us um, what we need to learn. And so because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we are able to approach scripture and um, it's called building biblical literacy. That's the big <laughs> word for it, but it's basically learning to understand what is in scripture. And um, so the homework is really simple and it's, and it's designed to kind of help um, be a starting point for you. Um, our goal is, should not be to check it off, um, but it should, uh, it's designed to kind of pique your curiosity um, and hopefully will equip you with the confidence you need to dig deeper. Um, I do not want you to be a librarian of Aaron's thoughts. I want you to have an encounter with our holy God and that he would um, teach you and that he would reveal himself to you through his word. So each week of the study will focus on a different aspect or piece of the tabernacle. So this first week is really kind of an overview of the tabernacle, kind of talking about the purpose and the contributions. But then from there, each week following, we'll focus on a specific piece of furniture that is in the tabernacle. So technically this is what's called a topical Bible study. Um, most studies that I've done in the past or typically what I love to do is, is to go through scripture a book at a time. So we're reading big chunks of scripture or in the case of Psalm 119, we um, it's a very long chapter. And so we went slowly through that um, or the wilderness study. We went through a section of scripture. Um, so this is what is technically a topical study. Um, but when I teach Bible study, we use four simple questions um, to, um, to help us interpret scripture. And this study is going to kind of help us learn how to apply that to a topical Bible study. So those four questions are, what does this say? What does this say about God? What does this mean? And what, um, sh how should I respond? Um, what does this say? So in this particular study, it's going to focus on the instruction and the construction of that particular furnishing. Um, what does this say about God? Uh, I teach from a God-centered view. Most of the time we have a me-centered approach to scripture. So those are questions where we would say, what does this mean to me? What did God tell me? So anytime we add me to the end, then we are kind of pulling the focus off of God and putting it on ourselves. But instead, we want to turn attention to him because this is a book that was written about him. It's not about us. And um, some of my greatest life change has been um, asking this question and seeing myself in juxtaposition to who God is. So even though this is the second question, you'll be able to find um, some characteristics as we kind of move through those first instructions for how to build that piece of the tabernacle. But you'll be adding to that list throughout your whole study week because as we move into the next question, what does this mean? Um, it, you'll start to, you'll see more. So don't feel like you have to sit down, write all that. And if you find something later that you missed it the first time, that's totally okay. Um, and I just want to remind us that there's some really hard topics that we are going to address here in the tabernacle, particularly around things like animal sacrifice. And some of the stuff is going to sound completely crazy 
in 21st century America. Um, so that's why we need to ask this question um, because we can allow those things to be distractions because of where we live and in the time we live, but we really want to press our minds to continue saying, what does this teach me about God? Um, what does this mean? So what is really neat about doing a study like this with the tabernacle is that we get to practice something where we use scripture to interpret scripture. Um, so that's called a cross reference. And so we're actually going to go all over our Bibles throughout this study. Don't be intimidated. Everything is laid out for you. It's really simple. It'll be really um, easy to understand, but um, it's going to be really exciting. So we're going to go to other places in scripture that better help us understand the meaning behind those specific pieces of the tabernacle. And then the last question is, how do I respond? So in your book, there will be a page um, at the end of each study week where you can kind of write a prayer. You can um, record a little bit um, about what God is speaking and um, how you should respond. Um, and then um, there's a sentence, because God is blank, I can blank. And that's just really a way um, for us to take his character and apply it to our lives. So it could be something like, because God is holy, I can follow and trust his rules. Something simple like that. Um, and so uh, the book will help guide us through all of that. Um, so Exodus 25 through 31 is where Moses gives, or sorry, where God gives Moses the instructions for the tabernacle on Mount Sinai. Um, and then it kind of skips a couple chapters where the golden calf and that story takes place. Um, and then it picks back up in Exodus um, chapter 35 through 40. And that is the actual construction of the tabernacle. Um, there are um, places in that of this that we will also focus on in Leviticus. And then um, we will also, as I mentioned, kind of jump around to some other places in scripture. Um, there's seven weeks to this study. Um, and in your book on page 18, there's also a map of the tabernacle. So we'll use that as reference as we drew each week. Um, and you'll also notice that each week is not broken up into days. Um, I always tend to find that um, that kind of sometimes gives me some false um, deadlines for the day. And if I can't get to it that day or um, I, or something happens or I get to a place where I just feel like the Holy Spirit is like, you need to rest and camp right here, that I fell behind. So I want you to know this is um, each week, all of the homework is over the course of the pages. It's not broken up by day. Um, if you have a rhythm where you like to spend 30 minutes a day doing this, by all means, please do. Um, I recommend going back and rereading um, God's instructions for each piece. If you do this over the course of a couple of days, um, before you start your study, like if you come in on day two, go back, reread that piece of the um, instruction just to kind of refresh your mind before you um, jump in and continue with the rest of the homework. Um, I really want this to be Holy Spirit guided, not Aaron guided. I um, want you to find the timing that works for you. I tend to study two to three times a week. Um, and then I meditate on these passages. I listen to them. I think about them all throughout the week. Um, but this should be a slow enough moving study that um, it really allows the truths that we are gonna study to marinate and soak in deep. Um, so the first time we do, anytime we're gonna do Bible study is we talk about context. Um, context is really important because while the Bible was written for us, it was not written to us. We are not the original audience. And so there are some things, and as we are gonna see, particularly in this study, um, the cultural differences um, of that day are very different than where we are today. And so we need to understand what is going on in history. We need to understand who wrote the book. We need to understand the genre. We need to understand um, what their purpose and intent was in writing. And um, so 
uh, those key questions and then keeping those at the forefront of our mind as we are studying will help us better interpret um, scripture as we are going through because we don't we want to rightly handle the word of truth and so we want to make sure that we have the right foundation before we start trying to interpret especially in um, a study like this where we're kind of jumping into scripture in various places so um, the the uh, tabernacle story or the tabernacle um, construction and instruction and sacrifices and laws all take place within the first five books of the Bible. Those first five books, the genre is they are called the books of the law. Um, they're also called the Torah or the Pentateuch. They were written by Moses during the wilderness wandering. So while the Israelites are in the wilderness for 40 years wandering, Moses writes these books. Um, that's kind of, they're written with the intent of kind of telling the Israelites who they are, where they came from, and who their God is. And then within those five books, each one has kind of a different niche or a different piece of that story. So the story of Exodus is really the story of the birth of God's people. Um, it opens with them being oppressed in Egypt. They're slaves. They're treated ruthlessly. God calls Moses. Um, and he um, comes and he says, let my people go. And Moses says, no, nine times. And there's plagues. And then he finally says, yes. And they move into the wilderness um, in Exodus 12. So um, we are going to spend the bulk of our time in Exodus. Um, and then, and it follows, that book kind of follows their journey out of Egypt and into um, the wilderness. And then also Leviticus. Now Leviticus is a gloss. Um, if you've ever read through the Bible in a year or done a full Bible reading, it's usually Leviticus where it gets really hard um, to read. So those are the two books we're gonna spend the most time in. Um, but two other books in the New Testament that we are going to um, talk to because as we, as the title of the study tells us, this all points us to Jesus. And so two, I just wanna give like a, a brief context of the, of the book of Hebrews, um, which is really a perfect companion to this study. Um, we don't know who the author of Hebrews was, but it was um, written to Jewish believers who are questioning their faith. This is during an intense time of persecution. It's near the end of the reign of Nero, and Nero was known for his persecution of Christians. Um, and it left many longing to walk away from their faith. Um, the book was written with the intent of how Jesus is the true way and that he is better than the old way. Um, it was probably written about 68 AD before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And that's really important to note. Um, the, temp the tabernacle is kind of the forerunner to the temple. So they're built by the same um, pattern, um, just with different materials, because the tabernacle, as we're going to learn, was temporary. It's a tent, and the temple was built permanently. Um, the other book in the New Testament where we're going to spend a lot of time over the next few weeks is John. John um, is the last gospel that was written. Um, it was probably written about 90 AD by John, who was one of Jesus's closest disciples. Um, he probably would have been in his 80s when he wrote it. Um, and he would have written his post-destruction of the temple um, and post-Nero. Um, but still during a time of persecution of uh, Christians. And he wrote the book. He actually tells us in John 20, verses 30 through 31, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He writes this collection of stories and proclamations by Jesus and miracles, all with the intent of showing that Jesus is the Son of God. And he leads at the end of each of those um, stories or proclamations he, and miracles, 
he leads us to a decision point. Will you believe or will you walk away? Um, and so uh, many of these stories and proclamation take place around Jewish festivals, which would point back to several aspects of the tabernacle. And so we're going to see that um, throughout this study as well. So that's a little bit about the actual scripture context. Um, I want to give a little bit of story context as well around the tabernacle and around scripture itself. So the Bible is, um, and you'll read this in the book, um, I grew up kind of believing the Bible was a collection of stories about what God wanted from me, um, that the New Testament was how you live, you know, here's what Jesus did, and here's what you need to do because of it, um, and the Old Testament was kind of a collection of stories of some really great people that messed up, but we really should act like them. We should take the good parts of those people, and we should be like those people. And it wasn't until um, several years ago that I began to understand that the Bible has a narrative, um, a thread throughout all of scripture. It's called the redemptive narrative of scripture. And it is this idea that God desires to be with his people. And he does whatever he can to make that possible. And that is the story of the Bible. Um, the book, the Bible is written to reveal to us who God is. So if we want to know who God is, our best source of truth about his character is found in the pages of scripture. Um, it also teaches us how he relates to us. Um, his desire has always been to dwell with his people. And as I said, that is one of the major themes we see throughout all of scripture. Um, Nancy Guthrie in her book, Even Better Than Eden, um, tells different stories, different threads throughout scripture. And one is the, the story or the thread of the dwelling place. And this is what she says about it. She says, the story of the Bible is the story of God working out his plan to be at home with his people. The great passion of God's heart as revealed from Genesis to Revelation, is to be at home with his people in a place where nothing can separate or alienate or contaminate, enjoying a face-to-face -face relationship of pure joy with no goodbyes. In fact, y'all listen to this one. In fact, one of the most amazing things about the story we read, we read in the Bible is that it is much more about God's desire to dwell with his people than about his people's desire to dwell with him. I found that awfully convicting <laughs> because our God so much desires to be with us and to dwell with us and how often we do not return that favor, um, that we do not desire him dwelling with us. Um, this is why a God-centered view of scripture is so important because when we keep him at the forefront, this is where we see a God so kind and so loving and so patient and so steadfast that he would time and time and time again make a way so that he, our holy God, can dwell in the midst of our brokenness. And understanding the story of the tabernacle and understanding God's desire to be with his people, his people starts in the very first chapter of scripture. In Genesis 1, we see the Garden of Eden. It is designed as a holy place where holy people would dwell with their holy God. But uh, so we see God dwelling with Adam and Eve. They dwelled with him. He walked with them. He talked with them. They had perfect, harmonious relationship with him. And then Satan entered the garden and he whispers the words he still whispers today. Did God actually say, or did God really say? And sin and brokenness entered our world. And there's this beautiful moment where we see God, for their protection, drive them out of the Garden of Eden because he knew that now they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But if they were to also go eat of the tree of life, they would spend eternity separated from him 
And so he drove them from the garden so that he could protect them, so that he could provide another way for him to dwell in their midst. Um, It's one of the things that I think sometimes we struggle with is this understanding of God's holiness and our unholiness and how God's holiness cannot dwell with us Um, and us live. We see it throughout all of scripture. We see it several places in the Old Testament and through the wilderness journey where God says, consecrate yourselves, purify yourselves, clean, get, you know, make sure that there is, um, we need to, it was like a symbolic washing of all the sin away so that they could even behold his veiled presence. And he says, set a boundary. And if anyone comes over that boundary, they will die even the livestock. And so because of that brokenness, um, we see in Isaiah 59 too, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face so that he does not hear. There is a separation that happens because of sin, but our God had a plan. So we fast forward to Exodus in the wilderness. And I kind of already talked a little bit about how the Israelites were enslaved and then um, they were redeemed. And um, it says in Exodus 12 that God led his people, the conservative estimates put it at 2 million people, but maybe even more, 2 million people leave Egypt freed. And he leads them by way of the wilderness. God purposefully leads them into the wilderness. So God's people have been redeemed from slavery and they are headed to the promised land, but in between they are wandering in the wilderness. And in our store, in our study stories from the wilderness, we really talked about how that is a picture of our Christian walk as well as our walk with Jesus, that we have been redeemed from the slavery to sin. We are headed to the promised land of heaven, but in between we live in this broken wilderness. Um, but it's important for us to know that the wilderness is not the wrong place. It's not the wasted place. Um, it is the very place that God leads us to himself. Isaiah 35, one and two says, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. And jumping down to verse eight, a highway shall be there and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. My friend Stacy Thacker puts it this way. The wilderness is the place where the redeemed learn to walk. And that is what God is doing with his people then. And it's what he's doing with us now. It's the place where we learn how to live out the faith that we have been called to. And so um, we see they are in the wilderness. Um, They are actually not intended to wander for 40 years, but we see um, in Exodus 19 and 20 that the people arrive at the mountain of God at Mount Sinai. God descends on a cloud of fire and lightning and thunder, and he um, gives the people of Israel a covenant. So I'm going to read Exodus 19, one through six. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up with God. The Lord called him out, uh, called to him out of the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So we see here that God brings them to himself 
on Mount Sinai. And he says, I'm going to make a covenant with you that if you listen to what I say and you obey my voice, you will be my treasured possession. You will be my people. And he gives them the 10 commandments. And he's kind of saying, this is what is going to define our relationship. This is what is going to define us. And in the midst of all of this, the Israelites grow afraid and they draw back and they say, we will not speak to him. Moses, you speak to him. And so Moses, um, because he has the fear of the Lord, because he has the awe and respect for God, draws near to God on the mountain. And he goes up there for 40 days. And this is where our story will pick up. God gives Moses a set of laws and plans for a dwelling place for his glory, the tabernacle. Um, our theme verse comes from these. And it's Exodus 25, 8. God says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. And I think it's important for us to note that there's a difference between God's omnipresence and God's special presence, his abiding and dwelling among us. Um, in Exodus 33, 16, when Moses is pleading with God to forgive the people for their sin um, with the golden calf and for um, for doing exactly what he said not to do and building an idol. <laughs> um, he says, um, Moses says, for how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? It is God dwelling among us that sets us apart from the rest of the people on the earth. We are distinct because of his dwelling presence. So I love definitions and words. Um, I often look them up in original language. Um, I use a website called um, biblehub.com or blueletterbible.com. Um, those are two simple ones where you can kind of um, dig into original language if you want. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament is written in Greek. So the Hebrew word for dwell that is used in our theme verse in, um, in Exodus 25, 8, it means to abide, to continue, to make a dweller, to have habitation. Um, it carries this idea of, of a permanent residence. This is not a, um, it's not a place that he goes from time to time. It's not his vacation home. It's the place where he resides. Um, and if it's too overwhelming to look words up in the um, original language, y'all, just a good old English dictionary is a great way to kind of add some depth of meaning as we're studying. So you're going to come across words and you're like, and there's going to be several places in this study where I have you look up words in the English dictionary and write out the definitions. Um, that's just to kind of help us remember, because we'll hear words where we think we kind of know what they mean, um, like purity even, or holy, but to, to write out the definition, it just kind of helps frame and make sure we have a right foundation. So the word dwell in the Merriam-Webster dictionary um, is to live as a resident. And so that is what God is saying. He's saying, I'm, and you're going to see in your study this coming week, God had been dwelling outside the camp. God had been going before them as and leading them as the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. And so um, he is saying, that's not where I want to be. I want to be in your midst. And in fact, the Hebrew word for tabernacle means dwelling place. And so we are going to see this dwelling place that God gives instruction for. Um, so real quick, as I um, kind of wrap up, I want to give you um, some real practical, um, <laughs> some practical stuff about the tabernacle tent. So um, Exodus 26 kind of lays out the plans for the tent itself. But if you read it, it's really confusing and hard to understand. It's curtains and loops and poles and hooks and, and all these things. So um, I just want to boil it down for you here. <laughs> um, the tabernacle tent consisted of an outer tent. Um, outer kind of wall of curtains that was 75 feet wide by 100 feet long. Um, it had three parts, the courtyard, 
Um, and then there's an, a tent that was in the mid, um, inside that had two sections. So there, the inner place would have been about 16 by 48 feet in impressive 15 feet high, think about that. They had no like cherry pickers or anything and they're carrying this thing around the desert. Um, and it consisted of two sections, the holy place and the, and the holy of holies. Um, and I think what's so neat is that they were dwelling in tents during this time and God comes to them in, in, and dwells in a tent as well. He wants to be with them. And so he has a tent like theirs. Um, up until this point, people would often build an altar. Um, so we see altars built throughout um, Genesis. But when the people move on, the altar stays. And what is so special about this tent is that it is designed to be portable so that as they move through the wilderness, God's presence moves with them as well. Um, this was the wilderness was not their final destination. And so he is going to travel with them all the way to the promised land. And just a fun note too, is that even when they get to the promised land, they set the tabernacle up and it was what they used until Solomon built the temple. So over 600 years, they used the tabernacle. Um, it's a series of curtains that form the outer wall. And then the inner place was covered by four layers of cloth and skin. So first there was um, linen, then the second was goat's hair, then the third was a ram skin, like a ram, uh, like a kind of sheepish, you know, with the big curly horn things. Um, and it was dyed red. And then there was a layer that scholars aren't totally sure what the word means, but many signs point to some type of sea mammal or sea cow. Um, so that is kind of the overall structure of the tent itself. Um, things to watch for as we study. Um, as you'll notice that as we get closer to the Holy of Holies, which is where the Ark of the Covenant is, it's where God's presence eventually dwells. Um, the, the materials and dyes become more precious and more costly. Um, so as you draw closer to God, there's a shift in um, what materials are used. Um, the tent itself is in, in the process that God lays out through this is a representation of Israel's relationship with God. But also one of the um, commentaries that I use um, is called the Rose Guide to the Tabernacle. Um, and this is how they kind of describe the tent. They say the tabernacle represented God's plan to intervene in human history to fix a broken creation. It is such a beautiful picture of what our God does for us. Um, this study gave me a clearer picture of what I have been saved from and what I have been saved for. Um, and I'm so excited that y'all are along on this journey as well. Um, God is very specific with his instructions, and there's a reason for that. It's because this points not only backward to Eden. So there are several parallels to the tabernacle and the Garden of Eden. Um, some, things, some of them are that both of them have an east-facing entrance, and there's only one way in and one way out. Eden had three parts. We see that in Genesis 2.10, and so does the tabernacle. It had the courtyard, the holy of um, the holy place and the holy of holies. Um, there were some of the same stones used in the tabernacle were also found in the Garden of Eden. Um, the lampstand that we will see um, in the tabernacle is designed to look like a flowering tree. And many people, scholars believe that that is similar to the tree of life, um, that the law represents the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Um, we can see the same language in Genesis 2.15, where God gives man the task to dress and keep the garden, as we see in Numbers 3, 6, and 7, where the priests are given work to dress and keep the tabernacle. Um, there are two cherubim woven, um, well, there are cherubim woven into the veil that separates, we'll get to that in the final week, but it separates the um, holy place from the holy of holies. Um, and there are two cherubim guarding the entrance to the Garden of Eden. Um, 
my ESV study Bible calls the tabernacle a step toward the restoration of paradise. So think of it as God, um, he is intervening to fix a broken creation so that he can dwell in our midst. But it doesn't just look back, it also points forward. It's a heavenly pattern. And this study is going to show us how each piece of the tabernacle points us to Jesus. Um, each one is what the author calls a shadow. Um, it's not the true thing, but it's meant to point us to the true, true one. Um, I want us to keep in mind this idea of grace as we study. We often describe or would define grace as um, getting what we don't deserve. And we often usually put it in the context of we get forgiveness of our sins. We get to go to heaven because that's not what we deserved. But the depth of the meaning of grace is so much bigger than that. It is this idea of God bending down to us. It's God leaning toward us. That's what we see in Eden. That's what we see here in the tabernacle. And that's what we see in Jesus. John 1.14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory glory as the, of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Y'all, he came here. He bent down to us. My friend Linda, who passed away last year, was a huge part of Feasting on Truth and a huge cheerleader of Feasting on Truth. And in her small group, she often would proclaim as we were studying, she would go she would see something incredible about God. And she would say, who does that? That is our God. What God bends down to his people who are messed up and full of sin and need a savior. And he doesn't just sit up in his throne in heaven and say, y'all figure it out. He says, no, I have a plan. And I'm going to lean in and I am going to make a way to enter into your brokenness and dwell in your midst. Each week, we are going to see the New Testament. We're going to go to the New Testament and we're going to see how Jesus has fulfilled that particular element of the tabernacle in the, our relationship with our holy God. And I want to close with one final little spoiler, because if you look at the map of the tabernacle and you trace the steps from the bronze altar to the bronze basin, into the holy place, to the lampstand, to the table of shoe bread, to the altar of incense, and into the holy of holies before the Ark of the Covenant, you will see that the steps they took were in the shape of a cross. It really is all about Jesus. And I can't wait to continue to dive in with you all. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word. God, I thank you that you bent down to us, that you did not say, that's it, I'm out. But Lord, you in your long suffering nature, in your patience and in your goodness and your faithfulness to us, you bent down and made a way for you to dwell in our midst. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes, that you would open our ears and open our hearts, Lord, to see you in your word this week. Be with us as we go out um, this week. And as we study, teach us, help us remember. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen.